Welcome to Behind the Police, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, which is normally a show about the worst people in all of history. And I guess it still is. Uh, but but recent world events um, have compelled us to create a special miniseries, Behind the Police, where we are going to be giving a detailed history of American policing. Uh, all the good, the bad, and mostly mostly the bad and the ugly. It's it's mostly <laughs> bad uh, and, and mostly ugly. Um, <laughs> And uh, in order to help me give this story uh, and tell it to the world, my guest today uh, and for the next couple of weeks uh, is Jason Petty, uh, better known as Propaganda. Uh, Jason, you are a hip hop artist um, and a podcast host. Um, that is and correct. Yeah. How are you doing, man? Hey, man, you know, West West and uh, the world's on fire, but NASCAR <laughs> stopped flying Confederate flags. So that's a thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> We're that's in a, a weird moment right now. Oh, yeah. I just like like snag a picture of 2020 and just mm-hmm. and like send it to yourself in 2018 and go, what stupid director wrote this storyline? Yeah, you know, it's it's wild. And like the wildest thing about it is that I think we were all at this point of getting like just completely exhausted by like this constant parade of like bad news and like yeah. political malfeasance and like horrible things being done by people in power and nobody was able to get on the same page about really anything. Yeah. Um and then all of a sudden, you know, um after the Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd and that video came out, for like the first time in a long time Almost everyone, like uh, most people, got yeah. broadly onto the same page. Like, I they, mean, we yeah. weren't even on the same page about a virus. Yeah, like it's like some, <laughs> some that don't give no shits about what political stance you are gonna kill you either way. We couldn't even agree on that. Yeah, but then yeah, this I, happened. I was like, we could agree that Black Lives Matter for real. <laughs> That's what we're finally agreeing on. Yeah, it, it yeah. Th- it's good. Um, broadly good. Like I'm kind of op- I'm 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 recording this from outside of the what will surely probably not exist by the time this airs, but was <laughs> briefly the uh, the the uh, Seattle the Capitol Hill uh, autonomous zone. I went to check that out for a couple so of days. Great. Yes, so- it's been wild. <laughs> I, I wish you could talk to me a little more about like there's got to be some sort of version of behind the bastards that's that is the Northwest. Yeah, it's like it's definitely a tale of two cities up there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I've been getting tear gassed in Portland for days, and they were in Seattle too. But then they succeeded yeah. in getting their police to like pull out of a precinct, um, which is wild. And now the cops yeah. are back, so it didn't last. But like, yeah. yeah. And you've been on the ground in in Los Angeles I attending have. some of the protests, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yeah. I how, have. how have you felt about that? Dude, it's like obviously the the sheer volume. I mean, because I was here for the you know for the yeah. L.A. riots. You know what I'm saying? So the sheer volume of people, the amount of of um, sustained energy has been like maybe something's different. You know what I'm saying? Um, the amount of diversity in the streets has been like, yo, maybe I guess after having to like take it to the streets since the the day after Trump was elected, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. From the woman's march all the way to the school shootings, to the to the climate, to the like there's no to the uh uh the damn um uh uh uh, uh Muslim ban. It's just like at some point we were just like, okay, enough is a damn enough. Um but I, I I like to be fully transparent, I think I echo like the sounds of 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 people who've been in like justice work for a while where like your arms are still kind of folded on the side. Like, okay, are you going to be here next week? You yeah. Know? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you like this song, but are you going to stay for the concert? Like this is a long concert. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah. It's a long, and I, I, I guess that's kind of why we're doing, you know, I, I, I yeah. after uh, like two weeks almost in the streets reporting on that, I kind of felt like the thing to do was to try to, um, because I guess it's, I think it's wrong to say that we're all on the same page. We're all reading the same book, and the book is mm-hmm. titled uh, "The Police Are Murdering a Whole Ton of Black People," um, yes. and also doing a bunch of other messed up stuff. And it, it it feels like for a lot of folks, the first time they opened that book was because yes. like they 
they went out to a protest and they got tear gassed and suddenly <laughs> were like confronted by the violence of American policing. Um, so I, I think now is a good time to go into a really deep history of American policing and, and let people it. know like where all this came from because this love didn't, it. yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's that, so, there's, I and I, and I know what I love about your show is, is I think why it rained so true with me. It was like, it's the stuff that like when we might be looking at the same dumpster fire, but I'm looking at it with a hundred years of history to know, like, I actually know what I'm looking at. You know what I'm saying? And like, y'all think I'm making this shit up. Like, I'm not, like, I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Like, yeah, just learn more and you'll stare at this dumpster fire like I am. Yeah, so let's stare at the dumpster fire, um, and 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 really just yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the story. Um, yes. As so, a side note, your camera is <laughs> phenomenal. Like, what's up with this depth of feel on your? Oh boy, Uh-oh. that's great, man. It's like blurry in the back. Like, look at this thing, oh, yeah. dude. Look yeah, that's that. so people don't see all of my uh, all of my uh, illegal uh, artwork. That's on the uh, walls behind me. Got yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very like, erotic. Yeah. You see my bed here is where all the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> and by magic I mean snoring and yeah. my daughter kicking me and my wife in our ribs. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, you, yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess let's get into it. So yeah. uh, obviously like the idea of law. Um, of, of there being laws that people could break and be punished that's existed for a, a while we all remember hearing about Hammurabi's code and stuff like mm-hmm. back in back in school um, but throughout history a surprising amount of societies probably most of them have lacked anything that we would recognize as like a police force and like an organized and kind of a modern sense of the word like a lot of times you'd have like the you know you'd have a military that would enforce some rules for like the king or whoever but y- you didn't have yeah. like beat cops rolling around you know scanning neighborhoods now the ancient egyptians had something that might be seen as kind of a predecessor to the police it was a small dedicated force for guarding the tombs of the wealthy uh as well as their businesses um Hmm. which will be something of a pattern throughout the the episode here (laughs) (laughs) africa Um, invents everything let's just gonna throw that that's the pattern anyway go on (laughs) including policing for the including policing well you can't they can't all be winners you know what i'm saying yeah yeah (laughs) It's not all writing. (laughs) Yes. No. (laughs) Um, So some ancient Greek city-states, including Athens, had what you might call a proto-police force um, as well. And and in Athens, this force was kind of geared towards protecting markets and keeping an eye on untrustworthy foreigners. So it was a little bit like, you know, a mix between normal police and ICE. Um, Now, this was not considered to be an honorable job. Uh, As historian P.K. Bailey noted in a 1928 lecture, quote, even in the enlightened democracy of Athens in the 5th century, BC. No free citizen was prepared to serve in that capacity, and such police force as there was consisted of foreigners with the status of slaves, who were the property of the states. In Greece, generally very few of the states seem to have made any provision at all, so far as is known, for the ordinary policing of their cities, though the state of Sparta certainly had a very efficient system of secret police. This is really interesting to me, especially (laughs) because of what comes next. So, Sparta really seems to be like some of the first police that are very similar you can draw a direct line from the spartan secret police to the the origins of american policing which we're gonna we're gonna get to in a little bit because the the secret police of sparta existed for one purpose and one purpose only and it was to clamp down on any hint of rebellion from the vast majority of the nation's populace see only about one in seven spartans were like the guys from 300 right that everybody knows like with the with the abs and the and the spears the yeah. vast majority of the population were, were helots. They were slaves, basically. They were, they were slaves. They were just straight up slaves. Like, it was a slave yeah. empire. Sparta was. So the vast majority of people in the country were slaves. And the Spartan, like, leadership and the Spartan, like, citizens spent all of their time terrified of slave rebellions. That's why the Spartan yes. army didn't actually leave the country all that often. Because, like, they'd, yeah. they'd get uprisen. <laughs> yeah. So they had all these slaves, and they had to, like, clamp down on them. And they established a secret policing force called the Cryptea, uh, which was made up of young men who had just finished the basics of their military training. So once a year, Sparta would elect a council of five ephors, or leaders, and as part of a ritual, these ephors would begin their term by declaring war on the Helot population. They did this every year. Like, every year we declare war on our <laughs> slaves. <laughs> so, the, so the Spartans had crypts, is what you're telling me. They did, called, they did, yeah. What were they called again? <laughs> Cryptea, the, yeah. The crypts, so they had crypts, so that's so they was the boys in blue. I'm telling mm-hmm. you, man, like, this stuff has been 
going on for a long time. The other boys in blue. And it was trying to keep the slaves. They were trying to keep the slaves mm-hmm. from rebelling. Everybody tuck that back in. Tuck that mm-hmm. away for a second. Keep that Just in your head. <laughs> keep that in your head. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so every year these elected leaders, you know, formally declare war on the Helots, and it's something of like a ritual. Like to, and, yeah. and this ritual is based around like keeping them from rebelling. So the Kryptea would be sent out to wander barefoot, armed with knives, into the countryside, and they would seek out the strongest and the smartest of the Helots, their slaves, and they would murder them in the night, culling what? the population of any potential. <laughs> leaders that like every year we go out we find the smart ones and we kill them so that they can't rise up against us what the f- <laughs> how is this efficient y'all telling me this is the yeah. pinnacle of western civilization that's where all the western yeah. civilization is trying to be okay got it 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 does make it kind of appropriate when you could a lot of american police officers wear like spartan helmet patches now <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and it's like yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> little on the nose. <laughs> little on the nose, fellas. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I should note here that there's actually there is quite a lot of historical debate about the Kryptea. Some scholars okay. agree with defining them as a secret police, as a force mm-hmm. to keep the Helots in line through regular murder. Uh, Victor Davis Hansen, who's a pretty prominent like pop historian, compares them to the Gestapo. But other historians will argue that the Kryptea were less of like a policing force and more of a guerrilla military unit, an auxiliary to the regular Spartan military that sort hmm. of. Um, also acted as kind of an advanced training program designed to blood new warriors by like giving them easy kills to help them get over any hesitation they might have to do violence. And I don't think these two views are necessarily in conflict. The Kryptea seem to have been like a dedicated guerrilla army meant to suppress dissent against the ruling class by doing violence to the impoverished majority who produced all of Sparta's value. In Hmm. this, they fulfilled a role not very different from a lot of police forces in Western history. Yeah, just, Um, guys, (laughs) he can't make this stuff up man because you, you can't we can't make this up <laughs> Bro, it's pretty I did, wild look, man, yeah i did I, I made myself today i was like mm-hmm. okay i'm gonna do a longer meditation i'm gonna do some yoga i am going to prepare myself for the amount of things you finna tell me right now and <laughs> none of it worked because i still picked the fight with my wife today it was like i'm sorry babe it's i'm, I'm we about to talk about the ancient police, okay? So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, come on. And for the record, fuck the ancient police. Fuck like, the, you know what? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> ancient NWA, like, yeah. you feel me? <laughs> what are they so, called? <laughs> the uh, the Roman Republic didn't have any kind of like formal. Po- national police force for most of its history and Rome which was like yeah. the biggest city in the ancient world for most of you know the time that it was like kind of the center of the world lacked anything that we would describe as like police uh, as Rome grew to become the largest city in you know its era uh, crime became an increasing problem the wealthy were able to use vast networks of clients Romans had this weird system whereby like if you were rich you gave money to a bunch of people who had less and they all had to like kind of have your back like everybody had a posse in ancient Rome that's the way to look at it. like every yeah, yeah, all the yeah, rich people had, had posses squad, yeah. yeah everybody had like a big ass squad yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so the wealthy were able to use these big ass squads to like you know defend themselves from aggression and murder their political yeah. enemies protect them in the streets and stuff um, meanwhile organized crime criminals and gangs did basically the same thing. And there wasn't really a big difference between like the rich and their squads and like criminal gangs. They were kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, now, victims of crimes had to either get revenge themselves or whip up a mob of their fellow citizens to help them in this task. There was a lot of whipping up of mobs in ancient Rome. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do I, I could just, it just makes, it just, it just tracks. Yeah. Like that yeah. just tracks so well, you know? <laughs> Yeah, we've always been the same species. People <laughs> just, we the same. Yeah. We are the same. But it, one of the best, my, my history professor in college, one of the best thing he said to me was like, if you want to know what happened in history, think about what you would do. Mm-hmm. You know yeah, what I'm saying? A, it's yeah. just us then. What would you do? It's history is us, them. Yeah, and in, in ancient Rome, like, the, the kind of graffiti networks they had really did act a lot like social media does, to the extent that, like, kind of famous and pow- powerful people would use, like, graffiti yeah. to get, like, shitloads, like, to, to kind of do the same thing that, like, people who get pissed off online and have a following can do, like, to, like but with a literal mob as opposed yeah, to an like online Yeah, like, I'm going to literally yeah. cancel you ancient yeah. style. Yeah, I'm going to cancel you by having 400 dudes stab you repeatedly. <laughs> like, yeah. And we talk about the government, like, the government yeah. I mean, there was, it was just kind of everyone. Yeah. It was kind of everybody. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Seneca, right. a Roman philosopher in this period, described street life in Rome this way. Some things will be thrown at you. Some will hit you. Um, which, you know, yeah. <laughs> you could say, now, yeah. Rome's first emperor, Augustus, when like the whole the Republic thing ended, uh, he established what's generally recognized as the city's first police force. And it would be fairer to describe them as like a fire department that also did some policing. Um, they were called the vigils um, and they stood watch at night and mainly kind of looked out for fires and attempted to stop the city from burning down because that was like a huge problem in Rome. Yeah. <laughs> and the vigils were armed, though, and they were drilled in a similar way to soldiers. You know, they used mm-hmm. artillery to shoot dampening materials onto fires, but they also had the right to enforce laws and had the right to enter private homes to capture thieves, return runaway slaves, and generally ensure order. Um, So kind of like a fire department mixed with a police force. Um, And this system didn't really spread widely throughout the Roman Empire, but broadly similar systems were established in a number of European cities intermittently over the centuries. The night watchman uh, was kind of the most common way that this this would wind up happening. And these were just, you know, in most of Europe, members of the community who like would rotate through the job of defending their town or city from external threats like invaders and internal threats like fire. Their primary job was to give alarm, to kind of get like everybody together so that they could deal with whatever problem, you know, happened in the night. And most of what we today would recognize as law enforcement was handled by citizens watching over their own communities. The English called this kin police as it was generally seen as the responsibility of individual families to watch out for and police their family members, right? Hmm. You know, there's not nothing centralized really in a lot of this period. You know, the Middle Ages and shit, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. So starting at your kids. Yeah, 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 just, yeah. Like, watch just, your people. Yeah. Hey, man, get your boy. Well, shoot, get your boy. Whose man's is this? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. It kind of does. Yeah. So starting anyway. in the Middle Ages, in, uh, like kind of the late Middle Ages, English communities began to, to develop something called the Franc Pledge system. Now, this was a structure by which small groups of men could enforce the law in communities. And it was based around 10-man groups called tithings, which were themselves grouped into hundreds and then shires, uh, which were similar to modern counties. So if you're wondering okay. where like the Lord of the Rings, why they call it the shire, that was like an yeah. old English word for a county. Yeah. Now- hey. The person who was in learned. charge, yeah, yeah, this is yeah. <laughs> so the person who was in charge of all of the different tithings, those ten man groups in a shire, was called the shire reeve, and that's where the word sheriff comes from. Is like the head of this like shire wow. you know, kind of community protection group, the shire reeve, the sheriff, and that's why the sheriffs yeah. run the county. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So that's where that comes back to. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And so far, we're like. This isn't something you can really like, obviously, like the Spartan police is terrible, but like yeah. this makes sense. Like, yeah, you take care of your community, like everybody kind of run, rotates through it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to be angry at it. No. Nah. Individuals within tithings uh, were expected to apprehend criminals and bring them to court, and Shire Reeves oversaw their work. When Europeans began, you know, genociding and conquering North America, they brought variants of this system and other kind of similar systems developed in other parts of Europe with them. Policing in, you know, the colonies, which you know we're broadly referring to, like mainly North America here. Like, I'm not okay. really, I don't have the time to like talk about like what went yeah. on in South America, like yeah. Central America. We're talking about like kind of the, particularly the English speaking colonies. Yeah. That, started on the East Coast. Um, Policing in those colonies fell into two broad categories, known to historians as the watch and the big stick. And I'm going to quote next from a paper on the history of U.S. policing by Dr. Gary Potter of Eastern Kentucky University. Quote, the watch system was composed of community volunteers whose primary duty was to warn of impending danger. Boston created a night watch in 1636, New York in 1658, and Philadelphia in 1700. The night watch was not a particularly effective crime control device. Watchmen often slept or drank on duty. While the watch was (laughs) theoretically voluntary, many volunteers were simply attempting to evade military service, were conscripts forced into service by their town, or were performing watch duties as a form of punishment. And I... I have to say, again, last night I was kind of hanging out in the autonomous zone and I volunteered to do a shift on the night watch. Yes. And I was definitely drinking. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> do, you know, we, <laughs> we look, in, in, in the hood, you know, again, yeah, like our, our, the, the pot we build is called Hood Politics. Mm-hmm. This is the pot I mm-hmm. host. But, and one of the things is like, I just feel like, Okay, no matter how unique our experience is, like you said, we're kind of, we're still all the same species, Mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about like um, neighborhood pigeons, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a, 
there's a misogynistic version of that. And then there's the other part that we would call the pigeon stool, which is like the guy who's supposed to sit at the edge of the street to make sure to see if the cops are coming. Yeah. Right. So that's your pigeon stool. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's drunk all the time. <laughs> he's drunk and, and like he's falling asleep and it's just so normal. And the hope is to do that because it's the easiest because it's odds are nobody coming. You yeah. know, so you could just sit over there and just kind of like he trying to holler at girls like, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just <laughs> it just on the one off chance that the police actually come around. I mean, that's your life. But mm -hmm. most of the time that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just sit there and drink and smoke. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> keep an eye on things, but not all hey, that hey, hard. Just make sure yeah. everybody. Uh, just make sure mama not coming. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so the, these kind of watch systems that started, you know, hitting you know the colonized Northeast were more similar to the pseudo police system that you saw in ancient Athens than anything else. Okay. Um, and you know, kind of the the other side of this was the big stick system, and, and this was the first real example of for profit policing. We're not going to go into tremendous detail about it in this episode. Okay. We're going to talk about it a lot more in our next episode, but I am going to give an overview here. So, in a, you know, we're, when we're talking about the colonies, we're talking about a very unregulated um, market for law enforcement in a lot yeah. of ways. You know, there's not an organized, centralized police, but there are merchants who have a lot of property, and those merchants want to make sure their property doesn't get stolen, um, either when it's in transit or when it's in a shop. And so, you know, they have, they have constables in these towns, and constables are either appointed um, – kind of in like a rotating basis. So like you do your, your brief period of time as constable or you're mm -hmm. elected to be constable. It was kind of, they, they, they did it a couple of different ways. Um, and as a general rule, because constables weren't really paid, um, like they had to develop services that they would sort of sell to people in order to make the job worthwhile. So sometimes they okay. acted, acted as land surveyors. They would verify the accuracy of scales. But they would also get paid directly by the merchants they were protecting. And so as a general rule, these constables were really just hired muscle for the business leaders in these communities. Um, and they would be paid by the people – um, you know, they, they weren't being paid by the state to enforce justice. They were being paid uh -huh. by people with money to enforce debts, to punish theft, and to even intimidate rival business owners, right? Like that. that goons. You yeah, they're, they're, they're goons. goons. They're good. Yeah, they're hired okay. goons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and obviously, uh, as you caught by calling them hired goons, this was not seen as an honorable job. People no. didn't really want to be a constable, right? Like there was no, no blue lives, like back the yeah, blue shit yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had no sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, historian Gary Potter notes that constables and night watch officers, quote, didn't want to wear badges because these guys had bad reputations to begin with, and they didn't want to be identified as people that other people didn't like. So there was a strong resistance with early law enforcement of being identified as law enforcement because nobody yeah. liked you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, wow. uh, some towns in colonial North, North America made service in the watch compulsory. Uh, rich people tended to pay poor people to take their shifts for them. And Potter notes that these substitutes were usually, quote, a criminal or a community thug. So, hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all, again, it all tracks. Yeah, it scans. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's all scans. So. In 1829, back over in England, Sir Robert Peel, who was the Home Secretary of England, introduced the Bill for Improving the Police in and, in and Near the Metropolis. Now, the goal of this was to take the airsat system of watchmen and the like and formalize them into a real police force. And the London okay. Metropolitan Police are generally recognized to be the very first modern police department in history. Um, and Peel, he's an interesting guy. He felt that the job of police should be to prevent crime rather than to punish it. Because that's kind of what, you know, all these constables – Something got stolen, yeah. you like you'd get paid to go like fuck up the person who stole it, right? Yeah. But like they weren't really preventing crime. So Peel was like, what if we tried to stop crimes? Um and he felt the best way to achieve that goal was with regular visible patrols of officers from a formal hmm. centralized apartment with uniforms and ranks and a clear physical headquarters. So that people like knew those aren't just dudes, like those are the yeah. police and they're like a part of the state. Now Peel felt that it was critical that only calm, even-tempered citizens should be police officers. He felt huh, they needed, a, again, yeah. 
Oh, what a thought. You know? What a thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one didn't really spread. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know much about the London police, but it didn't make it across the pond. <laughs> it just there's, there's a few things they, they threw out the bay with the bathwater in this situation. I get yeah. it. You didn't want to have a you didn't want to have a king anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't like the tea. I get it. But like yeah. maybe having a calm police force wasn't a bad idea. You yeah, took that, part yeah. of the Magna Carta, you was like, yeah. yo, this that this kind of seems like a good idea. Maybe y'all should have taken that one too. Yeah, and I, I did recently watch, like, again, the London police have done a lot of messed up stuff, too, um, yes. even with some of the recent protests. But I, I did watch that uh, when they threw the statue of that slaveholder into the bay of, in, in Bristol, um, into yeah. the, the, the channel, um, I watched an interview with, like, the local constable or whatever he was, like, the local police chief type guy in Bristol, because uh-huh. he was being asked by the news, like, why he didn't stop it. And his answer was basically like... Well, you know, I'm a cop, so obviously I'm not okay with property destruction, but we had a choice to, like, it, like our choice was to either let it happen or, like, basically fuck up people to protect the statue, and I felt like that would be bad for community trust in the police. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, See, that's a pretty that's, reasonable that's, attitude. That's yeah. thinking on your feet, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. you feel me? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. And he's like, fuck do I care about the statue? You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, Peel had some other ideas, too. Again, he felt that, like, police needed uniforms with badges that had visible display numbers. So he was the idea, like, yeah. police should have badge numbers so that you can That's identify brilliant. if you encounter a police officer, you can identify them. He also felt that police should not carry firearms. He, he, and again, that's like still kind of broadly applied yeah. in a lot of, uh, you know, English policing. Now, some of Peel's ideas quickly spread, obviously not the thing. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that again in part two. Yeah. You know, American police didn't initially have guns. Um, in 1838, though, the city of Boston became the first U.S. city to establish a modern police force. Now, mm-hmm. the creation of the Boston police, which we'll talk about a bit more in our next episode, was driven by largely a capitalist necessity to protect the property of big business. Boston merchants had been paying constables and the like to protect their goods for years, and they pushed for the establishment of a formal police force in order to shift the burden of paying for this onto the public, arguing that such a force would be for the collective good. So now we, the merchants, still get our stuff protected, but we don't have to pay every, or we, you know, we pay a little bit, but we pay a lot less because everybody's paying for these guys to protect our stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. Um, yeah. Now, we're, we'll return to these northern police. And again, our second episode is going to cover more of that because, uh, you know, while the Boston police are the first modern department in history, the roots yeah. of many U.S. police departments go back much further than 1838. And yeah. I, I think a lot of folks have heard, you know, through social media or whatever in the last couple of weeks as we've gone through this, this uprising, yeah. um, the idea that American police started out with slave patrols. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about now. And that's partly accurate. It, it's not fair to say that all U.S. police started as slave patrols, because yeah. obviously in the North, they didn't have, you know, slave patrols, yeah. really. They had, um, you know, it, it, it was a different route in the North. But in the yeah. American South, policing absolutely did grow out of slave patrols. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it came out, and you can draw a line between the two, because obviously like the first police departments in the North come out of a desire from, you know, people with money and property and shops to protect their property. And in the American South, policing also grew out of a desire for people with money to protect their property, but that property was enslaved Humans. by human beings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, who doesn't establish slave patrols? Well, that's not know, good. Man. I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think you never know, bro. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. You never know, man. <laughs> yeah. You know who historically might have tried to establish police departments to protect? Ah, this is... Oof. I'm not doing great with this. Hey, you know who... Uh, <laughs> Nah, I, I got none either, man. I'm yeah. sorry. Tried to we're help. Roll, we're going to roll ads now. <laughs> you could yeah. just simply go, fuck the police. It's an ad break. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we go. We are back. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're getting into, we're talking slave patrols now. We're talking slave patrols. Yes. So uh, the first slave patrol. Uh, was created in the Carolina colonies in 1704, uh, 126 years before Boston got its police force. And this is mm-hmm. again, we're not we're not even North or South Carolina yet. They hadn't gotten that far, but they knew they wanted Carolinas. Yeah, like, yeah, we were clear on that, and they were clear that they wanted slave patrols in those Carolinas. And oh, slave patrols. Caroline. Yeah, I know. Sorry, dude. Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm sorry. I yeah. was, first, I was going to go, oh, Carolina, but I was like, that's probably not going to land as well as Sweet Carolina. Sweet Carolina. Yeah. yeah. I think you read anyway. the room, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So slave patrols had three jobs, uh, to chase down, apprehend, and return escaped slaves to their owners, and to discipline slave laborers via violence if they broke plantation rules, and to act as an organized and constant form of state-endorsed terror in order to stop American slaves from revolting. Now, white Southerners lived in pretty much constant fear of slave uprisings. The Haitian Revolution, which started in 1791, it, and again, it's very complicated. The Revolution's yeah. podcast by, I think, Mike Duncan is his name, does a great job of breaking this down. But the end result of it is that black and slave people rose to, uh, up and murdered many of their masters. And mm-hmm. they also, to make this very complicated, a lot of their masters were also colored people. It's a very complicated yeah, this, rebellion. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> twisted. It's really twisted. It's just, yeah. Supremacy just really scrambles your yeah. brain, man. Yeah, it sure does. Um, okay, but, a side note about Haitians. Did you mm-hmm. know that that's where the word zombie came from? I do, yeah. Yeah, it's Haitian cool. it's a slaves neat story. came from a zombie. Yeah, and it is, yeah, there's kind of like some... I'm sorry, Sophie, it's history. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just hoping he doesn't sing the she song. She knows I'm going to start singing He's, the Cranberry song, don't Zombie, do it. but I'm not. <laughs> oh, that's I'm what gonna, that was? That's what yeah. I was like, was. Sophie got triggered, y'all. <laughs> I was like, he's going <laughs> to sing to me again, please. Oh, okay. It is kind of neat. I don't know. Neat may be the wrong word, but I, I do think like you can. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm wrong about this, but it seems like you might be able to draw kind of a line and sort of the impetus behind or like why kind of these the, like where the zombie sort of myth came from in Haitian culture and it's like roots yeah. to like the enslavement of of of, of yeah. black bodies and like kind of what the like what was kind of depicted in Get Out. Like I, yes, I, I, yeah. It is. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of ties to that to where you're just like you're a shell of who you are. Mm-hmm. So they were like they look like they're working, but they look like there's no, no life behind their eyes. And it's like, well, fool, duh. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Of course, there's not. Like this, is there anything more hopeless than where I am right now? You know? Yeah. And it yeah. was you know what what scared white people so much about the Haitian Revolution is that. It, it kind of proved that like oh no that light is still in there like you can yeah. you can beat them down pretty bad but like uh-huh. it never goes away and like yeah. if we're not careful that'll happen yeah. here and they'll kill us all um, yeah <laughs> yeah and and you know uh, unfortunately the Haitian Revolution remains the only successful slave revolt in Western history I think maybe yeah. the only the the most definitely the most successful slave rebellion anywhere in history really because like it, at it, least based it, on like the yeah as as far as yeah. like chattel slavery and like the transatlantic yeah. slave trade that's the only one that worked yeah 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 um, which is a it's I mean it's good that it worked but it's a bummer it didn't work elsewhere yeah. um, but the memory of this one successful uprising was was really lodged deep in the psyche of white Southerners and it scared the shit out. Of them, yeah, um, and you can you can hear echoes of that in the slave patrollers' oath uh, from North Carolina in 1828, and I'm gonna I'm gonna oh, read that now. Wait, um, wait, wait, let me take a deep breath before you do it. <laughs> yeah, <sighs> okay, go for it. Yeah. I, patroller's name, do swear that I will as searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, faithfully and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. So again, what they're looking for okay. here, they're, they're, they're trying to stop a rebellion. Um, so searching for weaponry is kind of like one aspect of how they did this. But really, the thing they did the most was beat the ever-living shit out of, yeah. out of slaves. Yeah. 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 Um, now, in most of the South, working in these slave patrols was an obligation for white men, uh, similar to compulsory military service. And in, mm-hmm. in most of the slave states, it was kind of broadly mixed between rich people and poor people. So like a lot mm-hmm. of slave patrollers didn't actually own slaves because they were yeah. you know, poor white dudes. Um, yeah. But it, it was kind of seen as a broad duty for white people to be in the slave patrols, for white men to kind of rotate through. Mm-hmm. Um now, the rich people could, in some places, like basically pay a fine in order to not volunteer in the slave patrol, um, and it was also not uncommon for like wealthy white dudes uh, and who were ironically the folks who owned the most slaves to pay to have poorer white men take their place. Yeah. South Carolina was unique in allowing white women to be called up for service in slave patrol, so that's wow. woke, like right? Yeah, well, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you pick your. You pick yeah. your oppression, and you're just yeah. like, this is the one I'm going to fight for, you know? It's like cheering when the CIA puts a woman in charge. It's like, right? oh, we did it. Like, hey, you <laughs> guys got one. Way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, I always say that, like, I always yeah. say, you know, obviously reading the room, like, I don't have to tell y'all this, but, like, just the difference between white people and whiteness, mm-hmm. you know, is like, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. Whiteness is a it's a, it's a thing. It's itself. This, it's booked and you know cooked into white supremacy. And from 
from my vantage point, it's like just how detrimental that is to the psychology of white people also. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like how, yeah, like you just, this rich dude hires this poor dude, right? So now the poor dude feel like, oh, I'm a little more important now. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But like, fam, you he don't, that man don't respect you. That man mm. don't love you. Why? We'll make you think he don't like you want you us. You one of us, fool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he's throwing yeah. you chump change to do a shit job. Um, that he think he better other people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna oppress you so you can turn around and oppress somebody else because the yeah. reality is I'm better than you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just like like it scrambles. It just it just it turns your brain to a pretzel. Just yeah. just does. Yeah. I'm not a not a fan. I'm, no. I'm gonna be on record about that. Taking a bold yes. stance. Yes, um, <laughs> and yeah. I am a fan of you too. <laughs> I, the band, and the two people I'm looking at. I am mm-hmm. a fan of y'all. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so yeah, South Carolina let let ladies be in the slave patrols, and I, I I'm not sure if they ever actually really did serve in them because they kind of they had the option to pick a male from their family to go in as a substitute. So I do think that happened more often. There may have been some women yeah. who rode with us. I, I I can't tell you, um, but yeah, and you know, in some states they were kind of more of like an airsat sort of force that was kind of cobbled okay. together. In some states, they were a professional paid institution that was like uh-huh. really kind of formalized. Um, in some states, their membership was cold from local militias. So, you know, they were they were different. They weren't all like, they weren't a, a, a uniform thing. But kind of the way they worked over the decades that slavery was, you know, a factor in the South, uh-huh. um, the way they worked kind of did become formalized. Now, historian Sally Hayden's book, Slave Patrols, is probably the most comprehensive history yet written about these the organizations, whatever you want to call them. She argues that in most cases, slave patrols consisted of members of all social classes. White people mm. were more or less unified in their obligation to suppress the black population and thus guarantee white supremacy. One piece of evidence Hayden uh, – or Haddon, sorry um, – cites to support this is an 1845 letter from a former South Carolina governor to a visiting English abolitionist. Quote, With us, every citizen is concerned in the maintenance of order and in promoting honesty and industry among those of the lowest class who are our slaves, and our habitual vigilance renders standing armies, whether of soldiers or policemen, entirely unnecessary. Small guards in our cities and occasional patrols in the country ensure us a repose and security known nowhere else. What? What? Yeah, that's how this that's how this governor felt. Um or at least that's what he wanted. And then, again, he's talking to an abolitionist from England here. So this is like kind of the propaganda spin of the slave patrols. Yeah. We don't have to have an army or police because our only danger is from uh, these black people, right? Like that's oh, what he's saying. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it's a brain pretzel, man. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, in all states, slave patrols did the same basic work, which included enforcing the curfew that slaves lived under, checking – which is – talking about curfews. Yeah, what the (laughs) fuck you mean curfew? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Checking traveling slaves for permission passes, breaking up unlawful assemblies of slaves, and, of course, (laughs) searching for weapons. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Just – okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna need you to def- I'm gonna need you to define your terms here, you know, overseer. Like, what do you mean by unlawful gathering? Yeah, this ain't my house. This ain't my land. I'm mm-hmm. not even my own. Would, I, would, tell me what I mean. What do you? Yeah. Where do you want us to stand? Where do you want us to stand <laughs> so that you don't feel scared? Yeah, that really is what it like comes down to. Is like, where where do we? What what can we do to not scare you? Do you want us how, to just how, like you, turn off after we're done farming? Like, you, that, what do you like? Yeah, yeah. Then then if that's the case, you should have just hired animals. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well, like, did, yeah, 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 true. That's how they felt. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, um, historian Sally Hayden writes in her book Slave Patrols. Quote. Uh, The history of police work in the South grows out of this early fascination by white patrollers with what African-American slaves were doing. Most law enforcement was, by definition, white patrolmen watching, catching, or beating black slaves. And I do find that really interesting because that's a through line right up to today. This fascination. Never stopped. Yeah. Never stopped, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the way she describes that, this fascination with what African-Americans were doing, right? Like that's what the, the origin of policing in the South. Um, Doc, have yeah. you heard of the have you heard of the phrase like 
it's it's in it's in like feminism also but the the phrase the male gaze yes yeah yeah so like in the same same thing in like black activism spaces where it's like the white gaze yeah it's just like what are you looking at all the damn time like good lord just make something up yourself like why like just can you go do something like you know, I think you said in one of your one of the episodes because I am an actual fan, listeners. I listen to the show, like that. You were just like, if we could just give just like white kids some cosplay, that's like you're allowed to just like shoot things into an open space. Yeah, and, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like then maybe you wouldn't just be so worried about like what I'm doing right now. You know? Yeah, like that's that's I. I, I do think Warida, which is, you know, our plan to wall off Florida and turn it into, <laughs> turn it into a free fire zone for just as whoever long as we wants like, a war. Yeah. As long as we, like, cover, like, Miami. Yeah. Just, just can we yeah, keep we can Miami? Protect Miami? Yeah, we, we can, can keep protect Miami. Miami. Yeah. Yeah. We have to protect, Orlando, friends, we have to protect Orlando. Orlando. Orlando real quick so that I can watch the NBA playoffs. All right. Well, we're, we're rapidly chiseling away at hey, this is not. We'll, we'll this is not as fun, out. man. Yeah. It's, Orlando's <laughs> too far inland. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll find a war state. We you know we'll figure it, it out. It, maybe the Panhandle. Yeah. Can we go like maybe Tallahassee? The oh, fuck yeah. the Texas Panhandle. Yeah, nobody likes that. Yeah, nobody just, likes it. Let, turn Abilene into a free fire just, zone. We'll why be is fine. Abilene a city anyway? <laughs> yeah, we don't like, need it. Abilene. Should not be a city here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'd apologize Sorry. to the Abilene listeners, but there's no one listening from there's Abilene. Four of you, and you all <laughs> yeah. left. You're in Dallas now because you realize Abilene shouldn't mm-hmm. exist. Yeah. Abilene, yeah. the place where you will absolutely get pulled over if you drive through, just because there's yes. nothing else for the cops there's to do. Nothing yeah. else to do. Abilene, where as soon as you're 18, we'll see you later. Yeah, yeah, get, yeah. get out of there. Yeah, just you're leaving. Yeah. So uh, yep. the violence meted out by slave patrols was neither random nor disorganized. Slave patrollers had the right to detain, interrogate, and search slave quarters. They were allowed to seize property at will, um, which was you could see as kind of an early form of civil asset forfeiture. Yeah. Uh, they also had the right to punish black people on the spot for infractions of slave laws. Now, physical punishment could be dealt out via firearms, but was usually dealt out by what were called either Negro whips uh, or Negro dogs. And I... Probably don't need to explain what ne- Negro no. dogs were, but they, they're they they're large bloodhounds that patrollers use both to track down slaves and to horribly maim them. Um, yeah. And, and and that is the term that, that historians use for these, is Negro mm. dogs, because that's what they yeah. were called by. Yeah. Um, so we're talking mostly about slave patrols, and there's there's a lot of other areas I could get into detail, and I, I just don't have the time to. But I, I should note here that slave patrols were not entirely the first thing kind of like slave patrols to exist in the United mm-hmm. States. Even before slavery was really common in the United States, U.S. settlers in New England appointed Indian constables uh, whose job was Sheesh. to police Native Americans, often by violent terror. Um, yes. And it, it's worth noting that uh, the St. Louis police, who we're, we'll be talking about a bit at the end here, were formed both as a slave patrol and as a patrol to defend white people against Native Americans. So that is a big factor in a lot of this, too. You know, mm. some of these areas, the Native populations kind of had gotten you know, exterminated or pushed out by the time things formalized. But in yeah. a number of particularly more, you know, quote unquote, frontiery places, slave patrols yeah. also did a lot of violence against Native Americans. And that is an important yeah. aspect of this. And yeah. even in the North where slave patrols weren't a thing, there were, you know, groups of vigilantes, well, not quite vigilantes, because they were sort of part of the government, yeah. who, whose job was to like, you know, do violence to Native people. Yeah. Um, so that is a factor in all this as well. Um, so, yeah, if we want to be perfectly accurate, the case is less, as it's made on Twitter, that U.S. police started as slave patrols and more that U.S. police started as a series of armed groups whose central purpose was to protect white people from non-white people via violence. That that would Bang. be – yeah. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that gets your uh... – your critical race theory juice is going. Yeah. The, the intersectionality of, <laughs> of oppression from the police. Like, it ain't, look. Yeah. We all, they coming for you too. That's always <laughs> been, that's always been my answer. Look, you chilling, they coming for you too. I hope you know. Yeah. So the institution of slave patrols evolved and formalized over time. And for a look at how that worked, I think it'll be useful for us to zoom in on the case of my home state, Missouri. 
Now, uh, Missouri entered the Union in 1821 as a slave state, and racism was obviously baked into the new polity from the very beginning. In 1825, uh, the new state passed a law banning any, quote, free Negro or mulatto from coming into the state under any pretext whatsoever. Um, which Oregon had a pretty similar but yeah. harsher rule after the Civil War. So, like, the yeah, yeah, idea yeah, yeah. of how racist Oregon started out as. <laughs> Um, 1825 is also the year that Missouri uh, established its very first slave patrols. And I'm going to quote now from a paper by Morehouse College professor Larry Spruill. Quote, by 1845, these patrols had permission to administer from 10 to 30 lashes to slaves found strolling about from one plantation to another without pass from his master, mistress, or overseer. Good Lord. <laughs> Strolling about, it, yeah. It's just you just don't, you can't go for no walk. What's wrong with you? And the dude, can, and you could just as what you just said. He's like, oh no, I don't have a like. I'm free. I don't have a master. Yeah. Well, you ain't got no letter from your master, nah, sir. Yeah. You're not listening to me. And I you, don't have a master. You know what well, I'm saying? You're breaking the law. <laughs> well, then you don't belong in this state. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. All right. I guess. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Missouri slave patrols worked at least 12 hours a month, uh, but also, you know, some people worked a lot more and members received about 25 cents per hour. Now, I should note here that the patrols weren't just randomly accosting individual slaves. Uh, enslaved humans in the United States resisted their situation in a variety of ways. Um, and so there were often like, you know, minor little uprisings that slave patrols yeah. were like working to put down. So slaves would often take crops and livestock uh, from, from their masters. They would burn fields and even plantations houses, they would poison their masters, and they would attempt uprisings. Um, And so, like the Spartan Cryptea, most of the work of slave patrols was broadly what we would call counterinsurgency today. In many Hmm. rural counties in Missouri, um, enslaved black persons were the majority of people, and whites were well aware that they had, you know, kind of a tiger by the tail. Spruill continues, quote, Southern whites developed a collective conscience and political consensus to tightly control blacks within their midst. Slave policing demanded accountability for every captive's whereabouts. A missing slave was cause for grave concern, often causing panic. Fear of insurrection made unauthorized blacks on roads or in the public square hazardous. Racial features made blacks visible, suspect, and vulnerable to slave patrollers looking to catch a inward, out of his place without a pass. Just as blackness was the stigmatized identification of bondsmen, it also singled them out as suspects and criminals. An enslaved African's phenotype marked them as a habitual, dangerous class, requiring relentless Hmm. supervision and policing to guarantee their submission. Yeah, that also sounds familiar. Yeah, that sounds familiar. And we'll be talking, the, 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 the term dangerous class is used constantly by historians who study policing in the United States that we will be talking a lot about the idea of dangerous classes yeah Um, it's an important concept you don't realize like how that like that that just poisonous stain like just that Mm -hmm. that that weird DNA strand just like stayed with us to the point to where you know you're I know you're gonna get to it later but like you know black men black boys being treated like adults when yeah. they're kids because you already think we're more dangerous and your first gun i was first time a cop pulled a gun on me i was 14 and i was like i didn't grow no facial hair i still had a mm-hmm. squeaky voice i it just was terrified he was talking to me like i was some hardened criminal and i'm like dog i'm a freshman i'm a <laughs> freshman in high school like i'm scared that i'm like my yeah. mom's gonna be pissed because i'm home late that's what i'm scared about my mom finna be pissed that I, i'm supposed to be home at 3 45 i'm gonna get home at 4 15 she finna be like where the hell are you you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. so like i'm i'm terrible and he's talking to me like i know like i don't even know the words he's saying is because you already see us already as dangerous yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah, this is this is like how that kind of starts yeah. and evolves and how that yeah. ball gets rolling to the boulder it is today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for a, kind of another I, a, another look at how people saw the slave patrols in that time, um, I want to go to a, a guy named Basil Hall. He was a 19th century uh, English traveler and author. He visited the American South in 1829, and okay. he wound up in Richmond, Virginia. His recollection of how slave patrols were explained to him gives us another insight into how white people talked about this institution to other white people, which I think is compelling. Quote, In walking round, my eyes were struck with the unusual sight of a sentinel marching with his musket. 
My companion said, and his companion is a local American Southerner, a white Southerner, obviously, it is necessary to have a small guard always under arms. It is the consequence of the nature of our colored population, but it is done more as a preventative check than anything else. It keeps all thoughts of insurrection out of the heads of the slaves, and so gives confidence to those persons amongst us who may be timorous. But in reality, there is no cause for alarm. The blacks have become more and more sensible every day of their want of power. After further inquiry, Hall noted, I learnt that there was in all these places and towns a vigorous and active police, whose rule is that no Negro, for example, is allowed to be out of doors after sunset without a written Hmm. pass from his master explaining the nature of his errand. If, during his absence from home, he be found wandering from the proper line of his message, he is speedily taken up and corrected accordingly. So that's a, a lot of that's interesting. Like the idea that like the police are here not just to keep, uh, keep, black people in line but so that frightened white people don't get scared yeah. of black people that's an interesting yeah. part to me yeah too. yeah yeah that's a good that yeah that layer yeah yeah man yeah yep that's yep. like it's here for the, we're here for karen's too <laughs> yeah 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 exactly. Hey, exactly hey karen you can always call us you can yeah. always call the cops here yes. yeah that's yes. exactly what's going on here <laughs> So, slave patrols were generally limited to pursuing escaped slaves within their own counties. Uh, When a slave or a group of slaves was fortunate enough to be able to move further away from wherever they were being held, uh, bounty hunters, uh, like slave bounty hunters, generally took on the job of attempting to track these slaves down. And these men were allowed to cross state lines, and their work was supported by the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed in Mm -hmm. 1850 as part of a compromise to try and avoid a civil war. The law mandated that all escaped slaves, if captured, be returned to their masters, even if those slaves had escaped to a free state. Abolitionists called this the Bloodhound Bill, after the dogs that bounty hunters and slave patrollers used to track down slaves. Solomon Northrup, author of the memoir Twelve Years a Slave, gave one account of what it was like to watch patrollers with dogs hunt down an enslaved black person. In this case, it was not even an escaped slave, but merely an individual who had broken his curfew. Quote, yeah. One slave fled before one of these companies, thinking he could reach his cabin before they could overtake him. But one of their dogs, a great ravenous hound, gripped him by the leg and held him fast. The patrollers whipped him severely. I I, I want to be careful. Yeah. I don't want to like draw because it, it it does a disservice to like the horrific suffering um, of, of of black people in this period of time and today to mm. to draw like too many direct comparisons. To, For sure, to, to some of the stuff happening now, but it's not. I, I I don't think we can go without entirely mentioning it that like probably a lot of people listening right now had violence done to them by police recently for breaking curfew. Like that yeah. is interesting to me. Like the the, the yeah. obsession with curfew is a through line, right? Yeah. That like if you're out when you're not allowed to, we get to fuck you up. Like yeah, and it's yeah. funny. Like I was talking with you know some of my friends, uh, my wife, even my daughter. I got I, my yeah. daughter's old enough now to like go to protest go to protest with us and you know and kind of like kind of do our own thing and just us at this point being like okay dude are you serious like yeah yeah, california (laughs) we just kept getting the alerts like four o'clock five (laughs) o'clock six o'clock it just kept you kept getting the amber alerts of the thing and it's like dude okay bro get it together all right and just talk to us later but it's kind of like we we were kind of like, is this a joke, man? Like, okay, so wait, it's a thousand dollar fine. Okay, throw me in the paddy wagon. Yeah, it's a thousand dollar fine. It's fine. You know what I'm saying? Um, maybe you're gonna rough me up a little bit, but I'm black. I'm from Los Angeles. You've been roughing me up my whole life. You know what I'm saying? So, for us, we were kind of like, it's kind of, it's kind of laughable. And then you go back to like, no, it wasn't always laughable. Yeah, you know, like this was terror. Yeah, th- yeah, this was absolutely terror. And I, I think yeah. they would have, it's interesting that it is talked about slave patrols as like a counterinsurgency, but like the way they c- countered the insurgency was by being terrorists. It was like terror. these guys yeah. were terrorists, yeah. Yes. And that's the first police departments <laughs> in a lot of <laughs> Ladies ways. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Spruitt's article, which we've been quoting from, includes a number of other firsthand accounts by enslaved persons of the use of these these dogs, you know, these bloodhounds, Negro dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, most of these accounts were taken down during the Great Depression, which is w- one of the coolest things they did during the New Deal is yeah. the FDR administration sent a bunch of people out to interview former slaves who were by now at yeah. that point quite old. But that's where we yeah. get a lot of our a lot of our like kind of formal stories of what it was like yeah. to be an enslaved person in this period. So thank you. The New Deal for that particular thing. It was a good call. Um, So one of these people who was interviewed noted, quote, 
In every district, they had about 12 men they call patrollers. They ride up and down and round looking for inwards without passes. When slaves mm-hmm. run away, they always put the bloodhounds on the tracks. They had the dogs trained to keep their teeth out of you till they hold them up to bring you down. Then the dogs would go at your throat and they'd tear you to pieces too. After a slave was caught, he was brung home and put in chains. Hmm. Yeah. So we also have recollections of slave patrol members of their use of dogs. One of these guys, in, who was a, a slave patroller in Louisiana in 1857, described his method of work thusly. Quote, if I can catch a cussed runaway inward without killing him, yeah. very good. Though I generally let the hounds punish him a little and sometimes give him a load of squirrel shot, which is like a light shotgun load. Yeah. If mild measures like these do not suffice, I use harsher punishment. The moment the hounds come close, they utter a hideous and mournful howl. Heaven pity the poor. Or, and then he uses the N word again. Yeah. So yeah, not a not a good dude. No. H- hope he no. didn't make it out of that civil war. Um, yeah, I'll be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, hope that guy got Gettysburg. Ah, <laughs> 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 it's a bird. Yeah, I hope it. he met Sherman or Grant or someone. Yeah, something. I'm about to Gettysburg this transition. Yeah, let's Gettysburg these ads like uh, pickets. Ch- I don't know. Fuck it. Yeah, Just run run done. the ads. <laughs> So we're back uh, and we're talking about the use of dogs to enforce a regime based in terrorism, um, Mm -hmm. otherwise known as the American South. (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of what it was, guys. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, the horrible wounds left by these these dogs s- fulfilled a dual purpose. They served as a reminder of white supremacy um, and mm-hmm. as an easy way to identify troublesome slaves because obviously there were a ton of slaves with horrible dog scars. And yeah. see, uh, other black people seeing those scars both would be like – white people have the power because like look at what they how badly yeah. all these people got fucked up and also it was a, a way for the white people to see like ah oh, that guy is that guy's trouble yeah. like it's, that was your arrest record was the dog yeah, scars yeah, yeah. on your face yeah yeah he's, um, the, he's yeah. the red no. he's the red sports car yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah that's what the teachers that's what the teachers tell you you know you're kind of yeah. a red sports car kid yeah just like well, the cops yeah. are gonna look for you because i expect mm-hmm. you to be fast like oh yeah thanks. Thanks, Miss Williams. Thank you. It's a pretty obscure, Jesus. deep cut, like no, I think that, yeah. But still, anyway, no, nobody tells white kids stuff like that. Or at least I didn't fucking hear anything like you that. You didn't right? hear the red car vet or the red sports car story. I mean, I got told as a as a young adult, I got told not to buy a red car because the police uh, cite them for speeding more often. But like there that, it is. that was my thing. Yeah, there, well, yeah. that's yeah, there yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, it is weird that we tell people in general like don't stand out or the yeah i don't know i don't want yeah, to be leaders don't stand thought. out what yeah. <laughs> yeah so um by the onset of the civil war bloodhounds had grown to become the single most reliable tool of oppression in the arsenal of southern whites like th- the dogs in particular were like the way in which more than any other tool white people like i think even the lash was used more as like a punishment, but like yeah. in terms of a tool of actual oppression, like the dogs were really like yeah. the, the fucking thing. Yeah. Um, and when the Civil War started, the organized and militant men of the slave patrols were all too happy to turn their counterinsurgency skills to use in a real war. One yeah. Union field officer scouting through rebel lands in 1862 reported hearing the constant barking of hounds, which would have been turned towards a new use searching for Union infiltrators. This mm. officer described dogs as the detective officer of slavery's police. Confederate generals also deployed bloodhounds on the front line. Black Union soldiers were considered fugitive slaves in arms, and it was seen as only logical that these Negro dogs could be used to break their will and send them fleeing from battle. You know, the, these Jeez. Southern generals were like, they're so scared of these dogs. If we use them against these new black military units, it'll make yeah. them all run away, right? Like, yeah, yeah, clearly, yeah. They, these these guys are, won't be able to ha- handle you know, standing yeah. up to dogs in combat. Yeah. This was one of many misconceptions that the South yeah. had about how things were going to go in that war. <laughs> On October 23rd, 1862, the Battle of Pocataligo Bridge marked the first mm-hmm. time black soldiers came face to face with the Negro dogs of slave patrols in open combat. The black Mm -hmm. soldiers were the men of the 1st South Carolina Colored Regiment, and their field report stated that the men met these dogs with bayonets, killed four or five of their old tormentors with great relish. And I'm not normally a killing dogs person, but in this case, it's a good story. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you, I, and I feel like knowing a little bit of your backstory, you'd be surprised when a person is like fighting for their life 
the amount of bravery and adrenaline that you can muster up when you're like, yeah. I ref- I'm not dying today. Yeah. It's not happening today. You know, so yeah, when you when you don't under if you underestimate that and you just think you you think this dog you think this dog finna stop these men, like you think yeah. I'm worried about that little dog right now? <laughs> nah, bro. <laughs> I'm we not got going back. Now, We're not going back. We <laughs> yeah. got guns now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So fighting between Confederate units with slave hounds and black Union units continued throughout the war. In 1864, one black soldier wrote a letter back to his wife depicting one such batter. And he actually wrote her a poem, and it's a pretty cool poem, so I'm going to read that now. We met the bloodhounds at the bridge. They ran with all their might. It was a glorious sight. We ran our bayonets through their backs. We shot them with the gun. It was all over with the dogs, and twas most glorious fun. In former days, those brutes were used to hunt the flying slave. They tracked them through their dismal swamps and little quarter gave. But when they tried the game of war, mm. we knocked them on the head. We shot them quick and ran them through until every hound was dead. Woo! Yeah, it's a good poem. Bars. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Sheesh. Uh, obviously, and um, spoilers here to the listeners who have not caught up to U.S. history past, like, 1864. The Confederacy didn't win um, I don't know the if war. You, yeah. Despite so I'm sorry the amount of, of flags like, that are flying, yeah. it's still in our country. <laughs> Y'all lost. Less, I'll tell you, one of the I, – I, I got to watch from a distance someone in my neighborhood in Portland have a real, like, like – growth moment so there's this you know the general lee the car from the yeah, Dukes yeah, of yeah. hazard that with oh, like totally. the confederate flag on the hood i had a little hot wheels one yeah sure yeah um there's a guy who lives not far from me who has like a who has that car like a perfect yeah. replica of the general oh, wow. lee and it had the confederate flag on it and for the first few months i lived there i would see him driving through the streets with his big confederate flag on his general lee and about th- two three months ago i saw him driving his car but he painted over the confederate flag and it was just orange Oh. And I was like, "Oh, you had a, you had you a, you had figured like a, it out. Yeah, you had a little moment. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, you grew a bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this, this is that, fucked up. <laughs> yes. See, that's what I mean by the Northwest, specifically Portland, yeah. is a tale of two cities. Because I'm mm-hmm. like, there's this just bastion of like left progressive, like freedom fighting, y'all throwing like, you know, tiger claw, damn like." hard hard ciders at the police you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. and then and then there's the guy with the and you right in my life mm-hmm. my life it's so a funny. complicated place yeah. yes no you're and then right, there's right. the guy with the robert e lee with the with yeah. the general lee car. like it's just it's two cities in one place yeah. some of the greatest coffee in the world oh great you know, coffee quote me solid beer yeah quote me some of the most mm-hmm. amazing beer mm-hmm. and then there's like and then there's salem Mm-hmm. And you're and like, then there's what Salem. The, <laughs> what the hell happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway. the Confederacy lost the war. And by 1865, um, both the dream of Southern independence and slavery uh, were dead. White supremacy, yeah. though, did not die. White people in the former Confederate states wasted no time in turning the institutions of the slave patrols into formal police departments. In yes. 1865, the editor of the Lynchburg Virginian noted, which was a newspaper, noted that, quote, stringent police regulations may be necessary to keep freedmen from overburdening the towns and depleting the agricultural regions of labor. The civil authority should also be fully empowered to protect the community from this new imposition. The magistrates and municipal officers everywhere should be permitted to hold a rod in terrarum over these wandering idle creatures. Nothing short of the most efficient police system will prevent strolling, vagrancy, theft, and other destruction of our industrial system. Mm. So, yeah. That's pretty clear. That's pretty great. It's the it's the like it's the moment like so the Chappelle show years ago had a skit where he depicted the day like the postman comes with the letter that the slaves are free right mm-hmm. and, like yeah, it's yeah, one yeah. of the greatest skits and they're just and he's about to whoop this whip this guy whip this guy whip this guy then the postman walks up and he goes well apparently apparently you guys are free and he just starts <laughs> like looking around at all the other slaves around him and they're like he's like uh Hey, sorry about that a second ago, man. You know, just like, so what do you do? Like, what exactly? So they're like, uh, we better, you know, we better, we better get us some protection because those yeah. last hundred years were kind of shit to them, you know? Yeah. Oh, shit. What if they treat us even a, a little bit as bad a as we treated bit them? As bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In her book, Slave Patrols, Hayden notes, quote, 
Policemen in southern towns continued to carry out those aspects of urban slave patrolling that seemed race neutral, but in reality were applied selectively. Police saw that nightly curfews and vagrancy laws kept blacks off city streets, just as patrollers had done in colonial and antebellum times. In the post-war South, police were seen as the single most important method of maintaining a system of, in the words of one prominent Virginia clergyman, liberty for the white man, slavery for the inward, so long as the Mm. white man is able to hold him. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Now, in the textbook Policing by North Dakota State's Caro Archbold, published by Sage Press, uh, it give, like that textbook gives a rundown of how slave patrollers transitioned uh, into policing freed blacks in the post-war period. And I'm going to quote from that next. During early Reconstruction, several groups merged with what was formerly known as slave patrols to maintain order over African-American citizens. Groups such as the federal military, the state militia, and the Ku Klux Klan took over the responsibilities of earlier slave patrols and were known to be even more violent than their predecessors. Over time, these groups began to resemble and operate similar to some of the newly established police departments in the United States. In fact, David Barlow and Melissa Barlow note that by 1837, the Charleston Police Department had 100 officers and the primary function of this organization was slave patrol. These officers regulated the movements of slaves and free blacks, checking documents, enforcing slave codes, guarding against slave revolts, and catching runaway slaves. Scholars and historians assert that the transition from slave patrols to publicly funded police agencies was seamless in the southern region Hmm. of the United States. So they just took these slave patrols, the war's over, now you're cops. That's literally how it went. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's not every, obviously not every police department yeah, in the South, because like a lot of cities and towns that are in the South now and have police didn't exist back then. But like, yeah. for example, the St. Louis police started as a slave patrol. The The St. Louis police department wow. that existed today began as a police. slave patrol. Yeah, yeah. The current St. Louis police have their Sheesh. origins as a slave patrol. <laughs> yeah. God so dog, man. a number of the St. Louis Police Department's first officers were former bounty hunters and slave patrollers, and they brought to their new job their old tactics, most specifically yeah. their old tactic of using dogs to torture and terrify black people. And here's where things get real, real, real angry, Macon, because the use of Negro dogs continues to this moment right now in present day St. Louis. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> talk to me, Nelly. Yeah. Huh? I said, talk to me, Nelly. I was just making a St. Louis <laughs> yeah, show. Yeah. Just so stomping in, in, in your Air Force Ones. <laughs> Okay. In 2014, the murder of Michael Brown by a Ferguson St. Louis um, police officer prompted yeah. an uprising by the city's black population. I think people are broadly familiar with this. And this was suppressed mm-hmm. with extreme violence. But the whole affair forced the Department of Justice to conduct and publish an expansive report on the Ferguson Police Department's behavior. Yes. This report concluded that, quote, the Ferguson Police Department engages in a pattern of deploying canines to bite individuals when the articulated facts do not justify the significant use of force, leaving Come serious puncture wounds to nonviolent offenders, some of them children. Now, the report went on to note that Ferguson police were allowed to sick dogs on suspects when any crime, not just a felony or a violent crime, has been yeah. committed. This permissiveness, combined with the absence of meaningful supervisory review and an apparent tendency to overstate the threat based on race, has av- resulted in avoidable dog bites to low-level offenders. And mm. the DOJ report kind of uses a little bit of weasel language on this fact, but one of the mm. things it revealed is that 100% of the people maimed by Ferguson police dogs were black see this like is it, how what am i trying to say right now what gets <laughs> yes, right, yeah. what gets under my skin in discussions of this is that it sounds so preposterous yeah that people say we're alarmists we're just making this stuff up you know that was a long time ago it's all in your head and it's and you like so after a while you actually start thinking, you know, maybe I am crazy. Mm-hmm. Maybe it is in my head. And then you're just like, and then you look at your other your other black friends and you're like, am I tripping or did this happen? And they're like, no, it kind of happened to me too. And then you're like, how about the other fucking side of the country? Did it happen mm-hmm. to y'all too? And you're just like, yeah. So then when you, and then when the report comes out, you're just like, guys, like I'm telling you, I'm not crazy. I'm yeah. telling you this is happening, you know? And I still got to convince you. And I'm like, what, do you, what how many receipts do you need? 
Yeah. And it it didn't convince. It, 2015, this comes out, and it's another like people seem more convinced now after everything yeah. that's happened. But like yeah. it took like five years after this report came out, and there was really you know there was an uproar over the murder of Michael Brown, obviously. Yeah. Um. But there was the fucking the fact that the fact that a police department formed out of a slave patrol that used dogs to maim black people in order to terrorize them was. 200 years later using dogs to maim only yes. black people in order to terrorize the fact that that was happening like yeah. that it was like yeah and then it was out of the zeitgeist and then it was out of the zeitgeist that's what I was yeah. going to say then it's gone out of the zeitgeist yeah. and it's and that's the other thing that's so hard about like and I'm and I'm critiquing myself period I'm critiquing all of us period is like mm-hmm. when when the cameras leave like how hard it is to keep the energy up to say look listen I know it was a high it was a high like you know, high profile case, but it's not done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And now that it's back, okay, it's a year later. Y'all forgot about Mike Brown because you ne- onto the next hashtag. But I'm like, no, seriously, we didn't make this up. Like, here's mm-hmm. the evidence. Like, I'm telling you, that's what happened. And it's like, it's you, 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 you find yourself like just exhausted as to go like, I just no matter how many receipts I give you, yeah, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. <laughs> Speaking of receipts, I do feel like I need to quote from the New Yorker here. And they, are, okay. they did do a pretty good article kind of digging into the use of these these dogs. So I, I do yeah. want to, like, credit them for that. They didn't, like, sure. look away. They, they you know, yes. they, they put out an article, which isn't nothing. Um, <laughs> quote. <laughs> in better one than account, not an article. Better than not. Yeah, right? Yes. Like, yeah. In one account, a dog was sent after an unarmed 16-year-old who was also tasered. The electric shock of that weapon partially paralyzes a person. If that were to happen while a dog was tearing at your arms and legs, all you could do would be to watch in immobilized horror. Another case involved four police officers, including a canine handler, trapping an unarmed 14-year-old in an abandoned basement. The crime? Trespassing. The Department of Justice report recounts what the boy says happened to him. When he saw the dog at the top of the steps, he turned to run, but the dog quickly bit him on the ankle and then the thigh, causing him to fall to the floor. The dog was about to bite his face or neck, but instead got his left arm, which the boy had raised to protect himself. FPD Uh officers struck him while he was on the ground, one of them putting a boot on the side of his head. He recalled the officers laughing about the incident afterward. Uh, The boys in blue. The boys in blue. (laughs) Yeah, the boys in blue, man. Yeah. You just, yeah. man, it's like, how many, how many bad apples you need before you start, like, checking the orchard? Like, yeah. what, if, what if the soil's bad? Like, how yeah. come nobody's, like, you keep talking about these, your tree yeah. keep producing bad fruit, like, and you yeah. keep blaming, like, something wrong with your tree, man. Yeah, all these apples are just filled with piss. Like, what happened? Why just, are all the apples pissed? Why are the, all the apples filled with piss? Ah, it's just yeah. one. Well, then why you, well, if it's just, why you putting it in a bucket? Yeah. Where why do the we good keep growing then? these apples? Why do you keep growing the damn apples then? Yeah. Maybe we get rid of the orchard. It's a bad I orchard. I don't know. Yeah. Like, it makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so uh, again, the the use of Ferguson police dogs made very little of a splash when it was revealed. Even though, again, a hundred percent of the individuals maimed by Ferguson police dogs were black, and ninety yeah. percent of individuals that the Ferguson police did violence to in general were black. Yeah. Names of canine officers and their supervisors were not revealed in the report. That Department of Justice report on the Ferguson PD made one hundred and thirty-seven corrective recommendations on how the department could fix its violent behavior. Only yeah. one of those reforms dealt with canine violence, suggesting that the police department require on-site supervisory approval before allowing a canine Sheesh. officer to maim people. It's so like, you gotta, you gotta call a manager engage. first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, if it's cool, I bite this black guy? Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I want to have a dog tear at the flesh of this 14-year-old. Is that cool? How's that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Glad we put, it, put this, yeah. this, this I requirement I did the paperwork. In. It's all good. Yeah. So as of today, Ferguson police still use dogs to control suspects. Most Ferguson officers are white. Virtually all the people they arrest and detain are black. No Ferguson officer has yet been tried or fired for using police dogs to brutalize citizens. Sheesh. Professor Larry Spruill notes, quote, The officer's procedural avoidance of criminal liability for death and torture of black citizens was not dissimilar to slave patrollers' antebellum indemnity for similar violence. (sighs) Yep. In his paper on Negro dogs and the Ferguson police, Professor Spruill cites two other academics, uh, Williams and Murphy, who wrote a 1990 paper on the transition from slave patrols to police departments. Williams and Murphy noted, quote, 
The legal order sustained slavery, segregation, and discrimination for most of our nation's history, and the fact that the police were bound to uphold that order set a pattern for police behavior and attitudes towards minority communities that have persisted until the present day. That pattern includes the idea that minorities have fewer civil rights, that the task of police is to keep them under control, and that the police have little responsibility for protecting them from crime within their communities. Oh, God. There we go. Oh, my God. Yep. Uh, maybe Portland so that, can throw me one of those uh, <laughs> one of those white claws. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was Sheesh. um, I missed this rally, but there was apparently a rally where some of the Antifa kids. Do you, you remember when there was that that Pepsi ad with um Kendall Jenner. Jenner? Yes. Kendall, Kendall Jenner, where she hands a Pepsi to a cop. Like right uh. after that ad, a bunch of those like kids showed up at this, uh, I think it was a May Day protest, with like uh-huh. like crates of Pepsi and just started chucking them at the cops. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. It wasn't me. I, you know what? I can give it to the Antifa kids, man. They got senses of humor, dog. Like, I just, y'all funny. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's I... You know, it, it's it's been interesting because, like, there, there's all this talk of, like, like Portland has, like, a big anti-fascist sort of activist community. But, like, with all yeah. the talk that there is with from the president about Antifa at these protests, they've really taken a backseat. Like, they have not been yeah. driving the fucking bus here. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that much. Um, and it's kind of obvious because I'm, like, it, in, in some ways, I feel like the, a lot of the anti-fascist dudes, like, they got a – they have a style. There's, like, yeah. an aesthetic – to what they do that like and i know it's a weird way to say it but i feel like i go oh yeah that's that's kind of their flavor and i'm like this ain't that yeah this this yeah. is just something else you know yeah i don't know yeah like it's a lot like of them when are... you see the, yeah when you see like the graffiti that says like blacks rule i'm like yeah a black man did not write that no he no, did not did. write that <laughs> just, that's when ridiculous it's... okay <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the flip side of that was like in Portland on um two Fridays ago, I think we had um, you know, a crowd march to the Justice Center, and then people just started uh-huh. fucking it up, like breaking yeah. all the windows. They lit some fires, yeah. like, and it was one of the, it was very obvious, I think, to everyone who knew the city, like, oh, uh, because this was like the day after the the precinct in Minneapolis was burned, and I was like, yeah, they're yeah, gonna fuck that Justice Center up. <laughs> it's it's going down. Yeah, <laughs> and there was like it was blamed a lot on like like white anarchist kids, and like yeah, there were definitely uh-huh. some of those folks doing it, but like it was a pretty diverse crowd that fucked up the Justice yeah, Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's not. Yeah, it's. You know, life in history is not so compartmentalized yeah. that you could just be like, this happened and this happened and that group of people by mm-hmm. themselves did the thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks wanted to get into that justice center and I'm rummage around. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so prop that is episode one and, and again this Sheesh. is you know the slave slave patrol a lot of you know this epi- oh, pretty much every episode is going to deal with racism because it's kind of central to policing but next episode we're going to be talking about sort of policing more in the north and, and kind of policing oh, against okay. against people we consider white but who at the time uh, the people who controlled the police might not necessarily have considered white you know that's, that's yes. a big part of this yeah. ooh I can't wait for this one because yeah. like at some point man I just feel like I know my work's going to call me to do a some sort of deep dive in the construction of like pan ethnic terms mm-hmm. like black or white and what the hell that means like you know even even hearing like the uh who was the Milo boy what was his name Milo, oh, Milo y- Yiannopoulos yeah yeah, yeah that, whatever yeah, the hell his that, name that is dude, yeah. him talking about like this our country was made for the advancement of white men and i'm like no it wasn't because there was no such thing as white men when y'all got here and you you ain't even you ain't even want the irish here that's the northern part of the same island Mm -hmm. for crying out loud so like you looking at them you don't think it's still people in this world that don't think italians are white like i just what the (laughs) hell are you talking about you know what i'm saying like so you don't even know what white means Mm -hmm. you know so I love what you're gonna go to next because just like you have to remember again, it's a construct. Like y'all made y'all made that up. Yeah. So we'll talk about that in part two. Yes. Um, prop, you want to plug some pluggables before we roll out? Man, yeah. Uh, so yeah, everything for me is prophiphop. Uh, dot com. That's my at mention. Just all of it. Prop hip hop. Doing a fun thing on Fridays called Porigami Fridays, where I basically just make a uh, make a a single cup of like pour over coffee with a buddy on Instagram oh, good right and now, we feature actually. like, 
Yeah, we feature like a local roaster uh, from wherever, like offer discounts and like, and since since this last you know uprising, we've been featuring like coffee roasters, you know, owned by by persons of color um, to just support to support good coffee. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So that's kind of a fun thing I'd I'd plug on this one. Since I get to come back three times, I get to pick what I'm gonna plug. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, man. well, check that out. Check out Prop and his his wonderful music uh, on his YouTube yeah. channel. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, well, Propaganda, people should know. If they look for yes. Prop, they'll find propaganda. something else. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, you know what? Actually, I would say, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up. Mm-hmm. So let me save all y'all the DMs you're going to give me. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I done already answered the question you finna want a personal answer for in one of these videos or interviews. So, like, so just, you know, check the YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh just just it's it's probably there. I we at, at some point we've talked about it. So I'm just <laughs> just just go ahead and put that out. <laughs> All right, folks. Um well we will be back like fucking four more times at least to talk four about four more times. American police. Um and where they came from. So I, I hope everybody enjoys this series. Um, and I hope yes. uh, folks pass it along to um, friends and family who might uh, think that policing just needs a little bit of like, just gotta like, just gotta like get some <laughs> schmutz off its face and we'll be back. To, we'll be fine. Like, we'll be fine. we can't go back to it being good. It, it was always shit. <laughs> we have to rethink this thing, you know? Yeah. And like, yeah. and, I, and, I, and it, I mean, I'm gonna come back to this a bunch of times. I know this episode got to end. I'm gonna come back to this a yeah. bunch of times, but like, I hope people are hearing that like almost, not almost, literally all of our institutions, we just made them up. Mm-hmm. Like, they're made up. You know what I'm saying? At some point in time, we made they don't exist in nature. Like, yeah. we made them up. So, if you have a bad idea in any other part of your life, you stop doing mm-hmm. the bad idea yeah. and you try to make a better one. Yeah, we can we can have a society where like if someone commits murder, there's somebody whose job it is to like figure out who did that and like make sure they don't get that's, to keep doing murder. Sh- we that we can happen. have that. We yeah. don't have we can have that without having a dude who feels empowered to choke a man for nine minutes. Thank you. We don't have to have both. You don't have to have both. (laughs) You mean to tell me the thought has never crossed your mind that Mm -hmm. the person that takes care of this homeless guy for loitering, who's just by virtue of his existence is breaking the law, and the same guy and the same tool needs to deal with the axe murderer Mm -hmm. that's toward... You you mean to tell me that that takes the same people? Yeah. I I just... There's, There's so better many ways fucking to do countries that have people right. who like make sure there aren't drunk drivers on the road, and the people who do that job don't have guns and don't <laughs> get to like throw people in prison and ruin their lives and search yes. them for drugs and plant drugs on them. Like you, you don't. You can have people whose job is like, yeah, we should make sure, you know, we should have some eyes on traffic because, like, of course, that's that's a big thing. Like somebody should that's be a like, good yeah, idea. let's keep an eye on that shit. Yes, without the other stuff <laughs> or legally yeah. you, go into a woman's house while she's sleeping and murder her yeah maybe There's we that. don't need no knock raids at all for any reason you, that's a bad idea <laughs> yeah. like why like wh- who just keeps who just holds on to bad ideas just mm-hmm. like it's a bad idea like let's just think of another one yeah shame we yeah. can't change well <laughs> yeah right for more bad ideas come back <laughs> on uh, on Thursday where we will talk about um, talk more about cops yep. yeah yep. have all right, that's us for now. Goodbye. Show's over. Behind the Police is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.